Hello, everybody. Um, so this is an introduction to um, dynamic earth unit. Um, what we're going to be looking at today, uh, today is uh, the first part of this unit on plate tectonic theory. So what do we mean by dynamic earth? Uh, dynamic earth refers to the fact that the earth is constantly changing um, and not just from weathering or erosion uh, things that happen in the atmosphere and hydrosphere, but we're talking about the geosphere, how different landforms are formed, uh, mountains, volcanoes, um, earthquakes, the distribution of those earthquakes, where they are, what does that tell us? And uh, the Earth is not unique in the solar system in that its surface is being constantly changed, um, but it is unique in how that change happens. Um, for example, the most volcanically active object in the solar system is Io. So the first large moon surrounding Jupiter, um, the first Galilean moon. Um, Io is um, the most volcanically active active object in the solar system. Um, its entire surface is constantly being recycled and covered with new molten material. But the reason for that is Jupiter's immense gravity stretching and pulling at the planet. Um, creating a lot of heat being pushed up by volcanoes. Um, the largest volcano in the solar system is actually on Mars. Uh, it's extinct now. It's called Olympus Mons or Mount Olympus. Um, Venus has active volcanism, um, but not as much as the Earth. So what I mean by dynamic processes, there are those processes that create and shape the planet. Um, we are unique in ours in that we have not just volcanoes and earthquakes, but we also have a constantly shifting and changing crust. Um, and that shift and that change creates all of the different landforms that we see. So what we're going to do in this section of notes is kind of just focus on plate tectonic theory. Plate tectonic theory is the, it's, it is the geologic theory that, um, provides the mechanism, mechanisms for how we end up with <clears throat> me, volcanoes or how we end up with um, mountains. Um, it describes in great detail all of the different landforms that we see and provides reasoning behind how the planet is shaped. So we're going to look at, look at it from the perspective of how do we know what we know. We'll uh, start with the early theory called continental drift theory move through that into C4 spreading theory, um, and then those two will combine into plate tectonic theory. And then finally, with plate tectonic theory, we'll look at how the Earth interacts to give us the different landforms. So we're going to start with continental drift theory. So um, this is kind of a sad story. This guy named Alfred Wegener, um, he was a German meteorologist. Um, he proposed his theory of continental drift in 1915. Now, this wasn't very long after the idea of uniformitarianism from James Hutton. Remember, the, pre the present is the key to the past, where those processes that are occurring today also happened um, thousands or even millions of years ago. This is at that time when it was really just starting to take shape. A lot of um, geologists at the time thought that the Earth still was the way it is now and will always be that way. Um, and so this theory um, proposed in 1915, it was a little radical for his time. Um, it was not accepted when he proposed it, um, not just due to the fact that it was a radical idea. There's other reasons as well, but um, it was really groundbreaking and kind of started the ball rolling to our understanding of today. Um, but it really was ahead of its time. So Wegener had three or excuse me, three or four main types of evidence to support his theory of continental drift. Continental drift theory basically says that the Earth was once joined together into a supercontinent called Pangaea, um, and that the continents have broken apart since and moved to their current present-day locations. And he had four main types of evidence that he used for that. One is the fit of the continents. I mean, this is very self-explanatory. Uh, you've all noticed how... Um, Africa and South America seem to fit together like puzzles, um, and this is probably kind of what started Wegener uh, on his journey of learning and trying to figure this out. Um, but then he also found 
other types of evidence that it was already out there. He just put it in this context. Paleoclimate evidence, uh, specifically evidence of glaciers in places where there are no glaciers today. Um, rock types matching across oceans. So this is before radiometric dating. However, they were able to analyze mineral content. <clears throat> and um, there are some rock types that match across, con uh, across oceans. And then finally, fossil evidence, the distribution of fossils that we find on the planet. So um, at this point, I'd like for you to kind of pause and watch the video in the slideshow. All right, so hopefully you learned uh, a little bit about Wegener and uh, his theory. And um, like I said, kind of a sad story, but fortunately, we've got some vindication um, because he turned out to be correct. He just didn't have the how right and uh so we'll get to that in just a second the big thing is rocks the rocks tell the story and when we look at evidence for continental drift we're really looking at different types of rock evidence uh to support it so let's start with ancient glacial deposits glaciers leave behind telltale cell um uh, telltale details um they leave signs behind about how and where they were. Glaciers are huge rivers of ice moving very, very slowly that can pick up rocks and boulders and debris. Um, they tumble it over over thousands and thousands of years, making them very smooth, but they can also carve into the rocks in the valley, making these long stretches, these long arcs, uh, glacial striation marks. And so what he found was that there are these ancient glacial deposits in places that don't have glaciers today. If you look on the map, southern Africa, southern South America, India, um, Australia, there, there are evidence of glaciers in these areas um, that when you look at them today, they don't really seem to make a whole lot of sense. But once you combine all this information together, we see that it makes perfect sense. Fossils. This is a very important one. Um, the distribution of different types of fossils today don't make a lot of sense. For example, uh, one of my favorites is uh, this fossil called uh, Mesosaurus. Mesosaurus is very similar to uh, uh, an alligator. It was a freshwater reptile. But this fossil was actually found in southern South America and southern Africa. So how could a freshwater reptile cross the Atlantic Ocean? Well, again, it doesn't make a lot of sense today, but if you put those two continents together, it makes perfect sense. Some other examples of fossils, um, and you can see in the diagram here, uh, these different organisms, but this one right down here, fossils of the fern glossopteris found in Antarctica. A fern fossil in Antarctica, a cold weather region. So how did that fossil get there? Um, was that area warm at one time? And of course the answer is yes, and it was closer to the equator. Um, so. Anyway, just taking out of context, when you just see this fossil in Antarctica of this warm weather plant, it kind of throws things off. Mountain ranges. Um, again, they didn't have radiometric dating at the time, but they were able to look at mineral content. And what they found was that there are minerals and rocks that perfectly match across oceans. Um, for example, the Appalachian Mountains here in North America uh, match up with the Caledonian Mountains in um, in Europe. Um, also, and not shown here, was the rocks found in South America and Africa, the uh, eastern coast of South America, the western coast of Africa, matching up perfectly. So with all this evidence that the continents were once joined together, um, it really challenged a lot of conventional wisdom at the time. Um, the big thing why his theory was not accepted was he couldn't propose a mechanism. He said that it was the rotation of the earth or um, gravity that caused the movement of the, uh, of the continents. And scientists agree that that was just not enough, that there had to be something else. And so it just was not accepted um, at the time. So if you get a chance, please um, take a minute and take a look at this little quick video um, about Alfred Wegener and his theory.
Okay, so now we push forward to the 1940s. Um, there was a new interest in continental drift brought about by some technology that are kind of um, came about at the time. First one is sonar. Um, if you don't know what sonar is, it's using sound waves to bounce off of an object like underwater um, to find out where that object is. Um, see it in submarines and submarine movies all the time. Um, fish finders use a version of sonar if you're a fisherman or fisher person. Um, but sonar basically just bounces sound wave off of an object and depending on how fast they come back, you can determine distance. Um, also, deep sea submersibles were becoming um, more available and so people were able to go down into the ocean floor. So consider this, what was the motivation to fund these technologies back in the 1940s and 1960s to 1960s? And what was going on big in the 1940s? Of course, World War II. So um, German U-boats or submarines, was a, they were a big threat to, um, to allied forces. Um, so there was a push to kind of discover not only where these submarines could hide, but if there was anything on the seafloor where they could hide behind. Um, so sonar was used, of course, to find submarines, but this guy named Harry Hess, he was a geology professor, but he was also a Navy reservist. Um, he was given uh, a post on uh, submarine during World, uh, World War II. And while they were out just traveling in open water, he would activate the sonar and just kind of get a glimpse of the ocean floor. And what they found was pretty astounding at the time because they thought that the ocean floor was just flat and abysmal, that there was nothing there. But they actually found a lot more than that. They actually discovered the largest mountain range on the planet almost entirely underwater. Deep sea submersibles also went down and saw volcanic activity on the ocean floor that they did not think would be there. So again, if you please watch the video. So Harry has basically said that the ocean floors move like conveyor belts and that it carries the continents along with them. Um, at the mid-ocean ridge, this huge mountain range that covers the earth like a baseball stitch, Molten material rises from the mantle, erupts, and spreads out, pushing the older rock to both sides of the ridge, and then the continents flow with that like a conveyor belt. Real quick animation. So in this, what you'll see is... Multi material rising at the mid ocean ridge, pushing the continents out to both sides. So, at about the same rate. Um, so, here it says about five centimeters per year. Um, that's a little bit slower than your fingernails grow. So, the mid ocean ridge is right there. This is the crust and the mantle. As this multi material rises in these really thin areas of the crust, it pushes out to both sides of the ridge, and that the continents kind of flow along with it. All right. So here is a quick little picture of the mid-ocean ridge. Again, looks like a baseball stitch. Um, each part has a different name. Like, for example, the one that goes in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean is called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, Southwest Indian Ridge, Pacific Antarctic Ridge. But it's basically, like I said, one, the largest mountain chain on the planet, almost entirely underwater. This is a bathymetric view, so you can kind of see the elevation of the ridge, and you can see it very plainly on the crust all over the planet. So in 1957, um, a lady named Marie Tharp took all this information from Harry Hess and from others mapping the ocean floor and, co and combined it into the first detailed bathymetric map of the uh, North Atlantic Ocean, 1961, the South Atlantic, 1964, the Indian. She did not receive a lot of credit for her work in a field, of course, dominated by men at the time, but um, 
her painstaking effort to create these maps really pushed ahead our understanding of how the planet worked. The evidence for C4 spreading. So continental drift had its own set of evidence, fossils, glacial scouring, uh, matching rocks, the puzzle fit. C4 spreading has some pieces of evidence to support this idea that the ocean floor is spreading, pushing the continents along with it. Um, it basically comes in three main types. The first one is rocks that were found along the mid-ocean ridge um, that looked like toothpaste squeezed out of a tube. It's called pillow lava. When molten material erupts underwater, um, it um, cools very rapidly and in stages and kind of pushes out and looks like a pillow. Um, so please, when you get a chance, watch these couple of little short video clips. Um, they're really interesting because as the, the molten material comes up and makes contact with the water, it cools very rapidly and then finds a weak spot and it continues to roll out. And it really does look like toothpaste. But these this is evidence for seafloor spreading because these rocks can only form from molten material underwater. The next piece of evidence to support seafloor spreading was absolute age dating. So by the 1960s, 1940s, 1960s, radiometric dating became um, much more widely used and understood. And what they found was rock at the middle of the mid-ocean ridge was younger than the, rock, the rocks farther away. Um, if you take a look at this map, this is uh, showing age of oceanic crust, um, color-coded, zero being the low limit, uh, excuse me, red being zero, uh, purple being 280 million years. And so if you look, you'll see that the age range of the rocks along the mid-ocean ridge are very young, and they get progressively older as you move out. And so, again, evidence to support seafloor spreading. And the last one is something called paleomagnetism. Paleomagnetism is a study of rock, iron bearing minerals in rocks. So when, an, when a rock is molten, the iron in that rock is free to move around. The iron will line up with Earth's magnetic north. Um, it's kind of a hard one to explain. So the rock gets to move like a compass needle. And so what they what you can tell, you can tell a couple of things um, by this. One, you can tell where magnetic north was at the time when the rock formed. Once it cools, it solidifies, and it's like a um, it's like a past record of where our magnetic north was. Um, so, what they found on both sides of the ridge was that the orientation of those iron bearing minerals was the same in a pattern on both sides. Earth's magnetic north is not permanent. It changes, it flips um, pretty rapidly from, by what we've seen in um, the rocks. We have not yet during recorded human history, remember we haven't been on the planet that long, um, we have not yet observed a full flip of Earth's magnetic field. We have tracked it and we know that it's moving and that it can become weaker. Um, which it seems to be, but what we see in the rocks is that magnetic north changes. doesn't mean that the Earth flips. It just means the North Pole actually shifts to the south and then back and forth. There's a lot that we don't understand about why this occurs, but we know that it occurs because it's recorded in those rocks. And so the reason why this is evidence for C4 spreading is because we see the same orientation in a pattern on both sides of the ridge, where we have uh, normal polarity facing towards the North Pole, and then Southern polarity facing towards the South Pole. It's the same pattern on both sides of the ridge. So here is a little quick animation um, to kind of show you what that looks like. All right. So normal polarity, reversed. Normal, reversed. This happens every few hundred thousand years. Um, and again, it's just evidence to support the idea that molten material is rising along the mid-ocean ridge, erupting and pushing out the rock on both sides, causing the crust to move like a conveyor belt. All right. 
Um, when you get a chance, please watch the video um, about paleomagnetism. Um, it's a tough subject, um, but really interesting um, because it paleomagnetism can not only tell you about how Earth's magnetic north moves, um, you can also determine the latitude of where the rocks came from based on the orientation of those iron bearing metals, which is really neat. Um, again, kind of renewing interest in that the Earth's crust is not as stable as we thought, um, because some of these rocks have really shifted positions um, from when they were created. So now we get to play tectonic theory. After seafloor spreading um, and way after continental drift, people were ready now for a more revolutionary idea. And so they had found a mechanism to help drive the idea that the Earth's crust is not stable, that it's constantly changing. And so here we have a Canadian geo geophysicist named geo J. Tuzo Wilson, um, who combined continental drift and seafloor spreading into one big theory called plate tectonics. Um, so this, this theory started brewing in the 1960s, and we still uh, refer to it today because it is such a good explanation for what we see. So here's the basics of plate tectonic theory. The Earth is broken like an egg, like a boiled egg. Um, these broken pieces are called lithospheric plates, and that these plates are in constant slow motion, colliding, moving away from each other, um, slipping past one another, and that th these interactions provide us with different landforms. So, sections of the lithosphere. What do I mean by lithosphere? You all know that the Earth has these main parts, the crust, mantle, outer core, inner core. So the crust, very thin, very rigid. Okay. Very thin, very rigid, just like the shell of an egg. The mantle, very massive, very large, solid. Please understand the mantle is solid. Um, and then the core, very dense in metals. When we get to plate tectonic theory, we have to divide it up a little bit more to explain what's going on. So the lithosphere. The lithosphere is the brittle part of the Earth that includes all of the crust and the very top portion of the mantle. And that is these, this lithosphere, this is what's broken into these plates that move and interact. The lithosphere plates float on top of something called the asthenosphere. Um, it's solid, but it's like a non-Newtonian fluid. It's weak, it's plastic-like, it's deformable, kind of like silly, silly putty. Below that, um, we have the mesosphere, and that completes the rest of the mantle. The outer core, which is liquid metal, iron and nickel, and then the inner core, which is solid. So the Earth is broken into these plates, and how these plates move around and interact gives us these different landforms. I'll show you what I mean. This is a map of the Earth, of course, but we can click on different things to take a look. Here are the plates. So you can see that the Earth is broken into some large, some small pieces. Um, the largest is the North American plate, um, followed by the Pacific plate, the Eurasian plate, the African plate. Um, these are pretty large sections, um, but there are some smaller ones as well. The Philippine plate, this tiny one called the Juan de Fuca plate, um, the Scotia plate. So these are the lithospheric plates. They are broken, um, and they move around and do different things. Some move apart, some move together, some kind of slip past each other. But how they interact gives us all of our different landforms that we're going to talk about. So let's take a look at each little section in just a little bit more detail. The lithosphere includes all of the crust. And you'll see a continental crust here, which includes the continents, and an oceanic crust on the ocean floor. Um, it's five to 100 kilometers thick. It's the thinnest section. Um, and includes those two types of crust. But here's the trick, something that you need to remember. Oceanic crust is denser than continental crust, not by a lot but that's gonna really come into play in just a few minutes. 
Oceanic crust is also primarily made of a rock called basalt. Continental crust is primarily made of a rock called granite. You should be very familiar with these. Remember, mafic, felsic. The asthenosphere, below the lithosphere, there are convection currents here. What I mean by convection, hot material rises, cold material sinks. And that causes movement, just like um, if you've ever cooked and boiled rice and you can see that it's constantly moving around or if you have a lava lamp another great example of convection material rises cold gets cold and sinks um, it rises because it becomes less dense it sinks because it becomes more dense the azinosphere is solid it's very thick but it's solid please understand that it is solid um, it is not molten um, but it behaves like a fluid because it is, it is hot enough to be molten, but the pressure keeps it into a solid state. And so it is plastic-like and flowing. Um, convection currents. In this animation, you're going to see convection currents in the azenosphere. But what that does to the lithosphere. So as these convection currents come up off of the core, go up through the azenosphere, you can see how they roll up under the lithosphere. It is the direction of these convection currents that cause the plates to move into the ways that they do. If the convection currents are moving away, it causes the ocean floor, for example, to spread apart, causes seafloor spreading. Where they push together, it causes plate collisions, and there's different types of collisions. We'll talk about those, but it's where these things run into each other. Um, but it's the movement of these convection currents that cause the movement of the lithospheric plates. The core, divided into two main parts. Outer core is molten, iron and nickel primarily. The inner core is solid. Um, the inner core spins inside of that molten liquid outer core. This metal on metal spinning creates a dynamo effect and basically creates a huge electrical current which produces Earth's magnetic field, um, which is very important because that protects us from a lot of radiation. Um, but that spinning inside there produces our magnetic field. Together, the outer core and inner core are about a third of the Earth's mass, um, but slightly smaller than our moon. Again, convection currents in the asthenosphere cause the movement in the lithosphere. Where they're moving apart, we have things like the mid-ocean ridge, where the, the crust is spreading apart. Where they push together, we have collision zones, um, which can do different things, like create mountains or create volcanoes and deep ocean trenches. Again, a little quick video here, if you would. Please take a look at that. All right, so let's talk about the movement. The average movement is a rate of about 17 centimeters per year. Some are faster, some are slower. Again, we're talking about the rate that your fingernails grow. So over a lifetime, it can move a little bit. Over thousands and millions of years, it moves quite a bit. All right, so hopefully you're starting to see how Pangea came together. Please understand that these convection currents are not permanent and they do change and shift over the millennia um, and cause different things to happen. Um, so here, just wanted to show you the movement, where they are pushing together. We have collision zones um, where they're moving apart, like here, a collision zone subduction or where they're moving apart, things like C4 spreading. But it is those convection currents that helps drive and move these plates around. So that's the reason for Pangea. That's the reason for C4 spreading. Um, that is the reason why the continents are constantly in motion. But it goes even further. Um, how these big huge slabs of Earth's crust interact, provides explanations for lots of the different landforms. So 
there are three types of interactions that you can have with plates. Converging, pushing together, caused by compressional stress. Divergent, caused by tensional stress being pulled apart. Or transform uh, boundaries, which are caused by shear stress. What I mean like shear, like sheep shears, something that kind of pinches down like that. But in this case, we're talking about shearing something like this sideways. So in a transform boundary, you'll have a lot more sideways movement. Um, here's a little interactive for you. Um, it'll go into a little bit more detail about each type of uh, boundary interaction. Convergent boundaries, divergent boundaries, transform. But here's the real strength of this. Let's scroll down to here. This map can show you, of course it shows you the lithospheric plates, but it can also show you the different boundary areas. So convergent boundaries, click that, that's the red. For example, here on the uh, western coast of South America, here up here, very small in the Pacific Northwest, all along the Aleutian Islands, off of Alaska, and you see all the red here. So these are where plates are coming together, convergent. Divergent boundaries, where it's pulling apart. You can automatically already see that most of these divergent boundaries occur along the mid-ocean ridge. There are a few on land, for example, Iceland and over here in Africa. And then the last one, transform. These are the purple. These are this type of plate interaction, slipping sideways past each other. The most famous that you are probably familiar with is right over here on the west coast, California. So each of these types of interactions, depending on the types of crust involved, give us different landforms. So we're going to take a quick look at that. Here's another map for you. So you can see convergent and divergent boundaries and some transform. So let's talk about divergent boundaries first. Divergent boundaries means being pulled apart. It means the plate is being pulled apart. The results. In a divergent plate boundary, if it occurs in oceanic crust, we have seafloor spreading, mid-ocean ridge. Pretty simple. If it happens on land, and there are a few places on the planet where this happens, if it happens on land, we have something called a rift valley. So here we're talking about continental crust, primarily granite, being pulled apart. So again, mid-ocean ridge, oceanic crust, basalt, more dense, on land, rift valleys. So this is in Iceland. If you notice, Iceland actually sits right on top of the mid-ocean ridge, um, but it's continental crust. So uh, through volcanism, we have a lot of big mass of granitic type continental crust sitting on top of the mid-ocean ridge, which is primarily oceanic. So this rift valley is a place where Iceland is being pulled apart. Um, of course, multi material can rise up along this area. As you know, Iceland is extremely volcanically active. But the cool thing is, and they have places in Iceland where you can stand on one side and be on one plate, the North American plate, walk across a bridge to the other side and stand on the Eurasian plate. Pretty neat. Another very famous one is the Great African Rift Valley. Um, so here along the Red Sea, it was actually created uh, as a rift zone, divergent boundary being pulled apart, water intrude, boom, Red Sea. But all along the eastern coast of Africa, we see the same type of interaction. One day, this will split. You'll have another land mass that comes off, just like down here, a little piece of Africa that broke off a long time ago. Uh, was that Madagascar? Sound right? Convergent boundaries. Now, convergent boundaries can result in three different things. Mountain ranges, volcanoes, or volcanic island arcs. And it's all dependent on the types of crust involved. So, let's do B first. Oceanic, actually we'll do A first, sorry. When two pieces of oceanic crust collide, you get a couple of different things. This is the B diagram. First, you get something called a deep ocean trench, and that's pretty easy to explain like that. It pushes down and creates this bend in one of the oceanic crusts 
um, and it creates this trench. On the other side of that trench, though, you will have volcanoes. It's through a process called subduction. What subduction means is as oceanic crust collides, the older, denser, cooler oceanic crust is going to push itself back into the mantle. It's more dense, so it sinks. As it goes into the mantle, it drags with it water, all those remains of dead sea creatures and organisms and things that have piled up, silicate material has piled up over millions of years. Those things have a very low melting point compared to the rock itself. And so as it goes back into the mantle, it becomes very volatile. That material causes the magma or it causes that rock to melt very rapidly. It finds a weak spot in the crust and comes up on the other side, creating volcanic island arcs. Um, some examples are uh, the Aleutian Islands off the coast of Alaska, um, the Philippines, Japan, lots of island arcs out there, some large, some small. When oceanic crust collides with continental crust, which one's more dense? Oceanic. The oceanic crust will always go back in. The continental crust is not dense enough to subduct. So you have the same thing that happens, but in this case, the volcanoes are created in the continental crust on the other side. So you have your, sub, you have your trench, you have subduction, you have that volatile melting magma bubbling up, creating a continental volcanic arc. Uh, the best example I can give you here are the Andes in South America, um, volcanoes dotted all along um, that mountain range. And then the last is continental continental collisions. This is where two pieces of continental crust collide. Because neither one is dense enough to subduct, you don't have this, you have that. Um, the Appalachian Mountains uh, and the Himalayas, especially. The Himalayas are still technically the that little, that is basically the Indian plate or part of the India Australian plate is still pushing into Asia, causing those mountains to grow larger. The Himalayas are still growing because we're watching the collision happen again about the same rate for fingernail scrap. Transform plate boundaries, there's no subduction, so there's no volcanoes. Um, there's no real big collision, so you don't have these big, huge mountains. What you do get are faults, which are cracks in Earth's crust and earthquakes. Um, they get stuck. So as they're trying to shear past one another, they get stuck and then they jerk pretty rapidly, causing lots of cracks in the rock, but also lots of earthquakes. The best example I can give you is the Mendocino transform boundary. And part of that boundary is the San Andreas fault system. This explains why all of those, um, why we have so much earthquake activity in and along the western coast because of this huge transform boundary system um, and part of that is the San Andreas Fault. In this image you can actually see where this line of material should be straight across but because it's a transform boundary the section on the right came down this way. So the importance of plate tectonics. Um, this theory provides a unified explanation of all of Earth's major processes. It explains Pangea, it explains seafloor spreading, it explains why we have volcanoes where we do, why we have uh, mountains where we do, and why we have earthquakes where we do. Um, let me show you this map and this is it. When you look at this map, this is current. Um, this is updated live. Um, the purple dots represent earthquakes within the past five years. Um, past two weeks are yellow. Yesterday was orange. Today is red. And it also is um, for the two weeks yesterday and today, they're also by size. When you look at the distribution of earthquakes, what do you see? You see plate boundaries. Earthquakes whether they're divergent, convergent, or transform, they all have earthquakes. Some of the most severe happen along transform and convergent boundaries. Divergent boundaries are pretty small uh, for the most part. Um, but these earthquakes tell us where these plates are. 
they outline the plate boundaries. If you look at the distribution of volcanoes, there's a map um, that I showed you earlier. Here we go. Put the plates back up. Earthquakes. Mid Ocean Ridge. Volcanoes. Take off these other ones so you can see. Even just the distribution of volcanoes tells you where these plates are. So we think of these earthquakes and volcanoes as destructive, but they also provide a lot of very useful information. Um, plate tectonic theory is an extremely powerful theory that explains all of this. Um, and lastly, it provides explanation for past distributions of plants and animals, that evidence that Wegener proposed. This is how, um, this is what explains why we find them where we do. All right. So um, again, please go back through the presentation, take a look at the simulations um, and animations, play with those. Um, as always, if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you so much.